Hello, I'm Kate Chabot. Welcome to SITREP, your weekly look at the big issues in defence and world affairs. This time, who calls the shots on military operations? The politicians or the military chiefs? David Cameron could shout at me and I, well, obviously wouldn't shout at him, but, uh, you know, we had a robust exchange of views. A former chief of the defence staff and a former defence secretary share their experiences and views on where the lines of command should be drawn. I was asked for for my approval to, for particular airstrikes, the type of munitions to be used, the blast area, but it soon became very obvious that that had to be delegated to our component commander. And one of Britain's most eminent military historians who's been analysing the biggest conflicts since World War II gives us his guide to the art of command. The generals need to understand what the politicians really want. Equally, once you've explained what may need to be done, the politicians may recoil in horror. Professor Michael Clark is with me as always. Mike, who would you rate as history's most successful commander? Oh, well, I mean, in history, that's always a big issue. A lot of American lists are produced about great commanders in history, and George Washington is always number one, which is ridiculous. Um, But they feel as if they have to say that because they're American lists. If you're talking about history, context is everything. Um, Alexander the Great, uh, Genghis Khan, both of them changed history and created enormous land empires through their conquests. Um, if you're thinking about British commanders, the combination of things you have to have, the ability to to use forces, to be strategic and tactical, to be political, to work with allies, uh, Marlborough and Wellington are the two most famous mm. British commanders. And then if you think about strategic commanders, purely strategic, Winston Churchill was not a military commander, but it's a good ex- example of context. Come of the hour, come of the man, his presence and his thinking as it were, affected world history in a pretty important way. So those are all important fa- characters, I think. So not just one, but several there. But with Mike and I today, a distinguished panel who have plenty of experience tackling the tricky questions of command. General Lord Richard served 42 years in uniform. He commanded operations in Afghanistan and Sierra Leone, to name but two, and commanded the whole army before becoming chief of the defence staff in 2010. Welcome to you today, Lord Richards. Uh, So Michael Fallon was Defence Secretary for three and a half years. Just weeks after he took office, the UK began Operation Shader, airstrikes against the Islamic State terror group in Iraq and then later Syria. Hello, welcome to you as well. Uh, But first, let's talk to someone who literally wrote the book on this. Sir Lawrence Friedman is Emeritus Professor of War Studies at King's College London. His latest book is Command, The Politics of Military Operations and Korea to Ukraine. Lawrence Friedman, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, First of all, what makes for good command and what makes for bad command? Well, I follow up from what Mike Clark just said. Context is extremely important. The sort of qualities that would make you a great commander in some circumstances might make you terrible in another because you might take reckless risks, lead people into, into catastrophe, uh, you know, even General Custer had a decent reputation before the Battle of Little Bighorn, and then it turned out not to be his qualities turned out to be pretty uh, useless. So I think context is important. You need trust. Um, you, you need authority. You need a good strategic grasp to understand what the battles are about and why you're fighting it. Of course, at different levels of command, the politics of the situation becomes more and more important. So just to take another example from history, Eisenhower was not a great battlefield leader. He hadn't led anybody into battle, really, uh, until he became became Supreme Allied Commander. He was chosen because uh, he was very good at dealing with allies. And another challenge for you I've got just now, uh, because your book looks at the balance of political and operational considerations through the lens of a series of command decisions since the Second World War. It looks at the personalities, the relationships, etc. I know this is quite hard to put you on the spot because you spent years doing this book, but could you give me just two examples of the best and worst in command? I know you mentioned Eisenhower there. but I'm going to take one person because he combines it, which is uh, Arik Sharon famous Israel general who eventually became the politician minister of defense and eventually prime minister. He was an audacious, talented commander. He could see possibilities that others couldn't see. He was prepared to take risks. His soldiers followed him even into very dangerous situations. And by and large, in his tactical 
operational encounters, he did well. So mm -hmm. at that level, he, he, he was a, one of Israel's great commanders. He was also a, a chronic insubordinate. He was convinced that everybody senior to him was in, incompetent or biased. And when he became Minister of Defense and had a chance to launch an operation himself, it was calamitous, which, which was uh, to occupy Lebanon, which he did without taking good advice on the basis of optimistic political assumptions, kept his political colleagues unaware of, of, of his plans, misled them, and got the country into an awful mess from which in some ways you'd argue it's never really uh, wholly escaped. So that they, they mm. have two different, or with one person with very similar, same qualities coming through, toughness, audacity, self-belief, produced very different results according to his position. Yes, and you write about that very interestingly in the book. Uh, Lord Richards, you get several honourable mentions in Professor Friedman's book. He, he quotes you saying, the modern commander must be an entrepreneurial networker and communicator rather than a dictator. How important is that small p political skill compared to your experience on the ground? Well, I think it's pretty, it is critical. Um, and I should say, having known Laurie for a long time, I think this is your best book yet. And I've been, uh, I only wish I'd been issued it as a student at the Staff College. Uh, I'd have learned a lot in advance uh, of, of the making some of the mistakes you uh, bring out so well. But I think the key, perhaps, you, we just want to get that, that the ratio, right? This book is about politicians and military commanders uh, almost equally and you bring it out really well Laurie that you know we're both good and bad at both things I remember when I was in Kabul as the ISAF commander the Italian ambassador gave me a, a well so I had a drink to save cheerio and he said we're trying to work out whether you're a talented politician masquerading as a general or a talented general masquerading as a politician and <laughs> inadvertently he actually put his finger on a, a, a key part of modern command at that level. But I would say at the tactical level uh, and I had many discussions with David Cameron about this Broadly, and it's not that neat because you need to have an understanding of the higher level, I'd say that should be left to soldiers, whereas the strategic level should broadly be the preserve advised by their generals uh, of our political leaders. And then there's the area in the middle, we sometimes call it the operational level, where it's much greyer. And one of the points, just quickly, I, I really enjoyed in your last chapter, uh, you talk about how important it is to have a good relationship at that level between politician and general. Uh, and I think that is increasingly critically the case in these more confused non-state on state wars uh, that uh, may not be the current sort of focus given Ukraine, but I'm sure is going to come back again. So, Michael Fallon, what, what qualities and behaviours did you most value from the military leaders who were under your command as their civilian leader? Well, I think, first of all, you had to feel you had confidence in your in your commanders. Now, I came at this not being having served in the military at all and without the kind of military background that, uh, you know, perhaps might have helped. But you absolutely had to be clear that you were... Uh, trusting your commanders, because you can set the rules of engagement. I did for Operation Shader that you referred to, uh, and they're slightly different for each of these campaigns. You set them. But of course, you have to trust your commanders you know, to keep to them as the situation then develops. And I mean, just reflecting on what the others have said, I suspect it's probably you know, much harder to be a commander now uh, in, in the modern political era than it was Obviously, in the past, the commanders I admired, a bit like Mike, were, you know, historical, like Caesar and Nelson. But they didn't have the kind of shorter communications you have now. They didn't have to deal necessarily with allies. And they weren't surrounded by the immediacy of media that, of course, politicians have to respond to. So to answer your question, you know, it, it is trust. It may well be in, in a campaign that involves a number of allies, your rules are slightly different to other allies, and therefore you have to trust your commanders, you know, not to abuse them mm -hmm. and uh, not to make it uh, more difficult to sustain a political consent behind a, a, a particular campaign. 
Michael Clark, just explain for us where the lines are drawn in UK military decision making. Let's take our most recent example, the evacuation of British nationals from Sudan, who in theory at least would have been making those decisions exactly. Oh, oh very clearly. I mean, the, the decision is made at number, in number 10, which in this sort of crisis is going to be. I mean, we know that the Ministry of Defence had an evacuation plan ready well over the weekend, probably before the weekend, actually. But they were ready to go. Downing Street was waiting until Monday evening before it knew that the United States and Saudi Arabia had got the ceasefire agreement. And then Downing Street, late on Monday evening, gave the go-ahead. And Mike, what is the military input into that decision? Well, the military input is to show that they've got the, the, the material ready, to, to be able to say, your Prime Minister, this is the way we do it. We've got two or three options here. This is the fallback. These are the things that might go wrong. But, Minister, it's up to you. I mean, that, you know, as Laurie wrote uh, many years ago, I mean, that was the Falklands issue. Mrs Thatcher wanted options, and suddenly she got the option from the Chief of Naval Staff, that, the, the option she really wanted, which was to take some risks. So, Michael Fallon, in your experience, is that how it works in practice? Yes, in the end, these are political decisions, and they, they probably have to be, because the balance of risk has to be borne by, by the minister, by the government, the number of casualties you might expect in a particular operation, uh, the amount of risk, that has to be weighed and taken by ministers. And secondly, it's only really ministers, and Lawrence brings this out very well in his, um, in his writing on, on Kosovo, it's only really ministers in the government who can deal with other governments, who can deal with other allies. And even in these extraction operations, you are, you know, you do have to pay attention to what the other allies are doing. You may require some logistical support from them. You don't want to be out in front necessarily, and you certainly don't want to be behind. So in the end, I think, you know, politicians have to say what their objective is. And then it's for the military to come up with a series of options as to how to put that uh, into practice. But, you know, as you saw with the fall of uh, Kabul, there is intense media interest. And we've seen that here over Sudan over the last few days. And it's not unknown, of course, for politicians rather than the military, for politicians to start wobbling and say, maybe after all, we could change back to option, option A rather than B. And Lord Richards, let's take an example from your time as CDS in 2011. The UK had a comparable evacuation from Libya. David Cameron suggested there were tensions between the political and the military that uh, you wanted written instruction from Number 10 as an indemnity. He describes himself shouting into his BlackBerry, just send the RAF now, do it now. Uh, what, what's your recollection of that? Well, I'm conscious that um, I've got to be slightly careful what I say. Um, <laughs> for for, once, for once, David. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'll, I'll, I will be uncharacteristic in this case. Then. Um, in that, um, if I may, uh, our previous speakers, Michael was good enough to concede. I mean, go back to 2011, uh, David Cameron, actually a very young man, even by my standards at the time, with very little experience, absolutely very good instincts. And and he was impatient with the, the sort of military bureaucracy that needed to do things in a certain way. I wanted, if you like, clear commander's intent. And I remember mm. saying to him, look, a, a term in the CCF at Eton doesn't qualify to do my job, Prime Minister. Just give me your intent. Um, and his intent at one stage was simply to evacuate people. And then it slowly morphed into regime change. And mm. I think that particular comment was uh, about that rather than the, the evacuation. But mm. we, we sort of did have a very good relationship, actually. So, yeah, he could shout at me and I well, obviously wouldn't shout at him. But, uh, you know, we, we had a robust exchange of views. I got his intent and actually used it subsequently. And I remember him saying once at an NSC meeting where I trained him to give me his intent and not much too much else, as far as I was concerned, he turned to me and he said, are you happy with that, General? Have you got my intent? <laughs> uh, and we, we sort of got there. So it was quite even, although it was all very serious. Uh, it was also, you know, we, it, we, we enjoyed each other's company. And I think that's very important. Uh, so, Lawrence, interesting what David's saying there. The fact that the relative uh, military experience or lack of it uh, there, is it as simple as saying, though, no matter what, the political leaders order what should and should not be done, and the military commanders then give orders of how to do that? Well, not wholly, because, because, I mean, politicians have their intent. There's no point in having an intent that can't be realised. Somebody's got to say, well, you know, we'd like to do this, but actually we just don't have the aircraft, or it's going to be too dangerous 
uh, to do it that way. We can do it that way, but you may not be able to do exactly as you want there. So I think that's why you need a conversation. The generals need to understand what the politicians really want, but there's no point saying, yes, we'll, we'll do it if you can't. Equally, what once you've explained what may need to be done, the politicians may recoil in horror because that's not what they had in mind at all and raises all sorts of new issues. So I think there has to be an underlying communication all, all the way through. And you know, Mike already raised the example of, of Henry Leach with, with the Falklands. The advice, I mean, it had come through the Ministry of Defence system, but there was no military officer there discussing the situation. So he turned up and immediately gave her an option she didn't have. And then they had to work out, did they trust what Henry Leach was saying? Because, you know, maybe he was rewriting the 1981 Defence Review and showing how the Navy was really very important when the review had said possibly it wasn't. So again, it's not a simple, it's never a simple question of, this is what I want to do. Okay, Prime Minister, this is how you do it. But that was a, that was a classic example of communication working very well though, wasn't it? I mean, I always cite Leach as a, as a model of military advice in the end because he was very clear what it would involve. That is, don't just send a token force. You have to send everything you might possibly mm. need. And then he went a little bit too far by saying you should do that, which he acknowledged in his memoir possibly was not his role, was what he felt, and, and it wasn't that surprising. So uh, whereas you can, I can think of other advice, for example, in 2002 on options for the Iraq war, which wasn't so good, which was reflecting an institutional preference very clearly, particularly from the army, rather rather than a full appreciation of, of the risks involved. Uh, so, Michael Fallon, let's draw on some of your experience from command. There's a really important example from your tenure. It was you who authorised the British airstrike in Syria against a British member of ISIS, Riyad Khan, in 2015. Was that a decision you felt lay solely with you, or did you feel like you were chairing a group that made that decision? Well, it's uh, difficult to go into too much of the background here, but some of these decisions are taken a little earlier than uh, than, uh, than when they're actually put into effect, um, because you have to deal with some, in those cases, some very direct threats to attacks in our cities in London or, or the European mainland and your privy to information about the imminence of those threats, and they have to be dealt with. How they're actually dealt with, yes, it was delegated uh, to me to take the final decision as to where and when the strike uh, was, was being carried out. But quite often, of course, these particular strikes were shared between ourselves and the Americans. But yes, when you're carrying out a strike that is directly dealing with the protection of your own homeland, Yes, that was a decision that uh, that came up to uh, to the Secretary of State. Michael Clark, there's a really important constitutional principle, isn't there, that elected politicians have primacy, that they command the military, not the other way around? Yes, of course. And I mean, most constitutions say that. Um, but of course, the, the importance is the culture, the political culture that underpins it. And, you know, I mean, I, I sat as an advisor to the um, Defence Committee in Parliament for more than 20 odd years. And I would see this quite regularly, that, that every now and again, senior military were giving evidence to the committee, and there'd be two and three-star officers, and if it was one of the chiefs, a four-star officer. And they would sit there in their uniform, looking fabulous, with years and years and years of experience and gallantry behind them. And they'd be facing this motley group of politicians, some of which were elected two years ago, <laughs> who knew nothing about defence. And they could have wiped the floor with them in terms of argument. They could have, and they never did. There was always this sense that, yeah, we are the military, you are the bosses. We work for you, and we will explain as patiently as we can why we did this, why we think that, what we, what we worry about. And in that over 20 years, only twice did I see senior military appear to lose their temper. I won't say who, but, but one was a, a chief of the general staff, and one was an ex-chief of defence intelligence. Only two officers I ever, ever saw on, on single occasions get rather testy. Every other time, there was this real sense of respect for the political community, however ill-informed <laughs> that political community sometimes revealed itself to be on the committee. Wasn't you, was it, Lord Richards? I don't think so, but... Um, I can confirm that it wasn't. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. <laughs> uh, but I, I think it's a really good question. In a context such as that committee, I wouldn't expect anything other than what Mike has just said. But if you're commanding 
I remember when I was ComISAF again, and, and the Sierra Leone operation you mentioned earlier is a different thing, but I felt it a bit. I felt completely let down by my political and military superiors, uh, particularly up the NATO chain of command, but also within the British chain of command. And actually one of the things Laurie brings out so well in the book is the muddled chains of command that often prevail and, and how that makes life difficult for people like me. But in uh, Afghanistan, for a while, I got to the point where telling my staff and indeed the allied sector commanders, you like, I used to come up with something, don't ask, don't tell, just let's get on with it. Yeah. Because, you know, we, we just wanted to achieve the political aim we'd been given, but were constantly being frustrated in that by often what we thought were quite ridiculous queries that I just wanted the politicians to give me clear intent and then help me deliver it by resourcing it properly. But to micromanage something like that made my already rather difficult life even harder. If I could just ask you about Sierra Leone, um, you famously went beyond your mandate there, turning a rescue mission into an intervention in the civil war. You also publicly con contradicted the Foreign Secretary on whether Colonel Gaddafi could be legally targeted in Libya. What made you think you were right to cross the line on those occasions? Well, I mean, they're, they're quite different. In, in, in the case of Sierra Leone, I knew the country and the politics of it much better, funny enough, than anyone else was involved. Because I'd been there the year before, and I knew the president, and I knew the uh, high commissioner very well there. And I knew that when we'd been asked to, or ordered to evacuate people, that actually that would have led to the collapse of the country. And I sensed, and this is again why the business of chains of command is so important that Laurie brings out, I sensed that the prime minister of the day, Tony Blair, would agree with me if only I I could get to him. Mm. Between me and Tony Blair was a very frustrating chain of command who didn't agree with me. So I sort of, I interpreted my orders creatively, someone said, and we were able to achieve the aim. And in due course, Tony Blair, you know, patted me on the back and said, well done, boys, sort of thing. But I was only a, I was only a mere brigadier. And what about speaking out about Gaddafi? Well, again, I, uh, I probably got that wrong in that I should have kept it myself. I was getting very frustrated with attempts to target Gaddafi, which uh, I felt needed to be much more carefully orchestrated. I, it wasn't that we couldn't do it, but when he was driving around in civilian areas, which as far as I was concerned, some idiot wanted to target him then and there, I said, no, there's all sorts of reasons why you can't do that. You can only really target him uh, when he's in a military context. And I was bounced by a journalist who came out and uh, across the road back to the MOD, Michael Tanner, I'll remember this route well. And in my frustration, basically I said, the, the, the law doesn't allow us to do what is being suggested. Um, mm -hmm. And I quite rightly got a rap on the knuckles, but we got on and we sort of sorted it out. Uh, so, Michael, for you as a political commander, is it acceptable for your military chiefs to cross the line if it turns out well in the end, as it did in Sierra Leone? Well, I think, David, you know, David took the right to risk. But uh, I think we have to be very careful of here. With due respect to Sir David, that was Lord Richards, that was a very limited operation. Obviously, there are implications if commanders go further than the originally defined intent, and there are implications for the government with allies and uh, you know with their domestic political audience. So, you know, there does have to be some control. But these are complex campaigns. Rules of engagement have to be adjusted as you go along. You have to redefine who is a civilian and who isn't. Uh, how far forward you can go in supporting the uh, domestic uh, power, for example. And there's always the danger of, you know, missions actually creeping, actually changing from the original intent. Mm -hmm. So there's a line that the military commanders might get close to, but wherever possible, I think, you know, they should, if they can, come back and clear their approach with the politicians back in the ministry, because in the end, it is the government that is accountable for what is done in their name and in the country's name, or well, what may be a very dangerous uh, operation. Michael Clark, let's look at a piece of command history being written right now, Ukraine. What does that tell us about the principles of command? Well, I mean, I think in one sense, it shows us both extremes. So President Putin has launched this invasion, which is strategically crazy, 
it cannot succeed in the way he obviously intended it to. And so not surprisingly, he sacked a lot of commanders. Dictators always sack commanders when they can't carry out instructions which are incapable of being carried out. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you've got President Zelensky, who in a sense, he's got an easy strategic job because they're fighting for their lives. It's straightforward. It simplifies lots of other things. But even there, we now see after a year, there is tension between President Zelensky and the chief of the general staff, uh, Zelensky. And those tensions sort of come and go a little bit. You know, in Britain, in the Second World War, Churchill and Allenbrook, who was the chief of the Imperial General Staff, that was the ideal pairing, it was said. Now, Churchill and Allenbrook were a great team, politician and soldier. And although they both respected each other and they both realised they were a great team, my goodness, they hated each other. We've talked very much about the high command level. Uh, Lord Richards, what lessons are in all of this for those who command as a level of captain or lieutenant? Well, as I said at the beginning, I think one of the key things is that they they need to read Lawrence Friedman's book because as they progress, uh, more and more that will be applicable. But I think, you know, at the tactical level, which is what you're talking about, Lieutenant Captain, that is really the point where the military must be allowed to do their business. Now, that doesn't mean that a a lieutenant or a captain shouldn't be aware of the political context in which he's operating. But I think if politics infringes on the right of the chain of command at the tactical level to do what, in the judgment of the commanders involved, is required, then we have a very difficult problem. And as Michael Fallon said earlier, in this day and age, it is actually quite practical for a prime minister or a secretary of state to get right down into the weeds. And my only worry, and I did, re- I think actually Lawrence uh, Freeman has put it in your book, Laurie, uh, that in the context of Afghanistan, yeah. I remember going to a National Security Council meeting uh, where the political leaders involved spent much of the time worrying about the deployment of a platoon. And I said to them, look, surely you got better things to do. I'm not even getting into the weeds of what a platoon or even a battalion commander is going to do. I absolutely trust him to deliver on our collective intent. That was a real conversation. I mean, to be fair to David Cameron, uh, you know, he sort of backed off and let me get on with it. But I I know it went on. I remember very quickly taking Nick Carter, uh, who went on to be CDS, uh, into, and he was on his way Uh, back to Afghanistan to be the deputy of uh, uh, ISAF, I took him into an NSC to uh, let him see the strategic level at work before he went back to Kabul. And as we came back out of number 10, he said, I had no idea what you were having to put up with at, at every one of these meetings in trying mm-hmm. to keep us, not not from discussing it sensibly, but trying to keep a, a hold on the tactical, operational and strategic and a little bit of clearance between each of them. Yeah. And there is, sorry, if I can uh, come in here, I mean, the, the, there are, the, the, there is an example of this in Shado, uh, which I was involved in, in the uh, campaign to deal with ISIS. When it began, having set the rules of engagement, I was asked for, for my approval to, for particular airstrikes, you know, the type of munitions to be used, the blast area, the actual uh, justification for each strike. This wasn't taking out particular terrorists, that came later on. This was, these were the airstrikes as part of the campaign. And, uh, and I did that for the first few weeks, but it soon became very obvious that that had to be delegated. And I therefore delegated it down to our component commander out there in, in the Gulf. And that had to be done on the basis of trust that he was going to abide by the uh, rules of engagement. He was going to abide by the advice of his legal advisor uh, and the rest of it. Sir Lawrence, the principles of command set out in your book, are they timeless or will technology and artificial intelligence change them completely in future? Well, the artificial intelligence question is a, is a serious one. Uh, I don't think so, but there are some decisions that are going to be harder for humans to get in the loop. Largely, I think these are probably quite narrow and defensive. I think there, there are certain features of command that come up time and time again. How much latitude do you give your juniors? How much delegation can there be? Uh, how do you deal uh, with insubordination? Uh, there's all sorts of I- issues that are always going to be there. And in that, I'm sure there may well be another book. Gentlemen, I'm afraid we have to leave it there. Otherwise, I think we could carry on for hours. It's been a fascinating conversation. Thank you, Professor Sir Lawrence Friedman, General Lord Richards, Sir Michael Fallon and Professor Michael Clark. Mike and I will be back with another sit rep next Thursday. For now, though, from me, Kate Chabot, 
Thank you for listening. Bye-bye.